And every time I start talking, she just gets really, really excited and starts going, I want to talk too. I don't know. Anyway, uh, I don't even know where I was. Hey, my name is Aaron. I'm one of the pastors at Element. Why don't you stand with me for the reading of God's word? <laughs> Either she doesn't want to hear me at all or she wants to make me. I don't know how it goes. Okay, this is Ephesians chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, and it says this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we ask that you would take us and move us deeper into this prayer of Paul's that tells us so much about who you are, how you see us, how you love us, how you call us. And I ask that as we walk each step through this, you would open our minds and our hearts deeper to the understanding of what you are doing, and we would see the great love with which you have loved us. Amen. Have a seat. All right, you guys came back, most of you. That's, that's great after last week. This is wonderful. Uh, I do promise once we get past Paul's prayer here through verse 14, we are going to speed this up a bit, but I really have to spend these first few weeks kind of slowing down, walking through all the parts of this prayer, because if I did speed up too much, you would be like, what is happening? I don't understand this. We want some cohesion to understand how Paul starts the book. If you have a Bible, open to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. That is on page 633 if you're using one of the Bibles at Element. Now, as Western thinkers, we tend to get caught up in different words and phrases. Last year, my wife and I got a, a new dog. She's a puppy at the time. We named her Wednesday, not because of the TV show, but because we got her on a Wednesday. We're creative like that. Anyway, so we got this puppy. Her name is Wednesday. And I got to tell you, potty training a puppy is, having a puppy is almost worse than having a cat sometimes. And I know, I know how I feel about cats. It is hard. Every 15 minutes when they're awake, taking her outside, go to the bathroom. This is where you pee, not in the house outside. But then we're walking to the door. She gets distracted like at the cat. Woof! Squats, pees right there. I'm like, ugh! I'm trying to teach her how to fetch. My old dog, Haiti, when she got all rambunctious, I would throw the ball and she would chase that thing till she was dead tired. And so I'm like trying to teach this dog how to fetch. And she wants to play tug of war instead all the time. You're going to be sitting there. It's like nine o'clock watching a TV show. And she walks up with her rope, lays it on your lap. She's like, let's go. And I'm like, I am not fine. And I'll hold it. And then she goes, Arr! and the chair goes, she's part husky. And Shepherd, so she's big and she's strong. So uh, she pulls the chair. I'm like, uh, but I'm trying to teach you how to fetch, so I don't have to do that. And we go out there, and I throw the ball, and she'll be like, ah! Halfway to it, there's a leaf, there's a blade of grass, what? and she just gets so distracted. So what I'm what I'm telling you is that we are like that when we come to the Book of Ephesians. How our brains have been taught to think. We're walking through all of this stuff, and our brains almost play us for a disadvantage because you're gonna you're in a puppy in a wonderful world. Yay! It's so great. And then I say something that Paul writes, and you're, you're like, what? What? And you get distracted, and you start focusing on that. So last week we talked about this word called election. We were being chosen by God, and you're like, what? And I'm like, okay. So I explain it. Now I'm like, okay, good girl, let's go. We're gonna. <laughs> so now we're gonna try and move on a little bit. But Paul says, Ephesians 1 verses 3 and 4, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. If I glossed over that, you would be like, what? Chose us? What election? What, what does that even mean? So again, I'm trying to help us to move forward. But you have to understand, this idea of election is central to this chapter, to the book, to the Bible. Verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Verse 5, in love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. You go down to verse 11, in him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things together to the counsel of his will. You just can't get away from it. So if you weren't here last week, I'm going to briefly recap this before we move on. And I mean briefly, as briefly as I can. What is this election thing? Well, essentially that God has loved you before time is even time that God has known you and he's going to bring you to himself, that he loves you. Now, that is in his timing and his way. could be three years old, five years old, 90 years old, 100 years old. It's his timing and his way. John Calvin wrote this, The very time of election shows it to be free. For what could we have deserved or in what did our merit consist before the world was made? 
we weren't even here and God had us in the back of his mind. Now, many people have a hard time believing this the longer that you are around in a church. You have a hard time being really excited about what this means before time even began when God is simply in his godness. Well, that's what we have to understand. Before anything was made, no universe, nothing but God existed. And God, for a lack of a better term, okay, I'm sure there are better terms I could use, but for lack of a better term, God was anticipating, excited about the day which he would not only save us, but sanctify us. And if you know me, I love Christmas. I love giving gifts. If I get a gift for somebody, it's so hard for me to leave it in the closet all year, but I have this anticipation for the day when I can give a gift to somebody and they're like, oh, wow, I gave a gift to somebody this year and they almost cried. I'm a good gift giver, all right? <laughs> They didn't. It was just close. But, you know, it, I, I, I give that to them. Now, but then after they open it, it's like two days later, it's like, okay, I'm done with it. But God gives us this gift of salvation, and it never gets old. For eternity, this gift comes to us. And this, if you understand it, leads you into a deep and rich theology about God's call and His goodness and His grace. And as we are people, we tend to struggle. We tend to get disappointed with our lives. We get frustrated at our failures. And we start to think that God is the same way, that God only tolerates us, you know, like a puppy. There's a reason puppies are so cute, because they would die otherwise, because you get tired of it. But Paul says the opposite is true of God. In Ephesians 1, he says, this is not God. Before the foundation of the earth was laid, he is going to adopt you, make you holy, blameless in, this, in his sight through the work of Christ. And so when you have the best day in the world and when you have the worst day in the world, God is at work. He has never once abandoned you and he loves you. Now, God, in the midst of our lives, is going to come throughout it and start to pry our hands off certain things that are detrimental to us. Uh, Matt Chandler says, it is not unloving to break the hand that's holding on to something that's detrimental to the soul. So in these verses, what you see is the choosing was before time as we even know it. Secondly, the reason of God's choosing were only in himself. In love, he predestined us, meaning the choosing cannot be separated from God's love. It is fully entwined with that. It is not a roulette wheel. It's not a roll of the celestial dice. It was according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. Purpose has the connotation of pleasure. Pleasure has the connotation of good desire. The ground of God's choice is his love and good pleasure. It's not our goodness. It's his grace. And the third thing is this choice was made in him, meaning in Jesus. Everything in creation comes from Christ. There is this hymn in Colossians, which we'll get to in a couple years when we hit the book of Colossians. I'm not gonna be, we're going to be in Ephesians that long. I'm just When we get to Colossians in two years, uh, there's this hymn, and it essentially says that he's the foundation, the origin, the executor of everything that is involved in salvation. All the fruits of it that come out of it all depend upon him. John Stott wrote this, the doctrine of election is a divine revelation, not a human speculation. That means that this is not something we could have thought up. It's not something we could have dreamed up. It's not dreamed up by Martin Luther or Augustine or John Calvin or the Apostle Paul. And a humble view of election really shows that there's no room for pride in our lives. It is just humility and thanksgiving. And there, again, there's so much in that. That's my recap. Let's start to move on today. I promise you we will get through the Three verses <laughs> we're going to cover today. But here we go. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 7, says this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Originally in the Greek, verses 3 through 14, it is one long sentence. And hopefully you see why I'm trying to break each little piece apart for us as we begin to walk through it. And the importance here is, it, the order here is important. It's grace and salvation. But it's hard for us to get. Paul understands this, but he keeps pointing to the great mystery of God's will that's been made known. So what I'm going to do with you today is I'm going to talk about this word mystery. I'm going to talk about why Paul uses it and then the mystery that has been revealed to us, that we are chosen by the Father, redeemed by the Son, and sealed by the Spirit. Okay, so this word mystery. The word mysteries come from, comes from the Greek word called mysteria. It has a long past. It is originally a reference to these secret pagan rites that they did called the mysteries. So here's the history of the mystery. What, what? Okay. 
All right. Uh, one of the earliest references to this word is in the 7th century BC, and it's what is known as the Homeric Hymn to Demeter. So in this story, the goddess Demeter is looking for her daughter Persephone, who had been kidnapped by the god Hades. So Demeter is wandering the earth, and in her quest to find her daughter, she comes to the city of Eleusis. Eleusis is run by a woman at the time named Queen Mantenaria. Queen Mantenaria does not know who Demeter is. She doesn't reveal herself, but Queen Mantenaria Mantenaria takes Demeter in to the city and kind of begins to take care of her. Now Demeter, when she, because he's welcomed by the queen, decides to do a really nice thing for the queen in taking care of the queen's son, Prince Demophon. Now this kid is ill, so each night she brings this boy next to a fire, and at this fire she would feed him with the nectar and ambrosia of the gods. So one night, the queen says, what are you doing with my kid? And then Demeter reveals herself and what she is doing. And the queen says, oh, that's amazing. Could we build a temple in your honor, a sanctuary, where you will teach us all of these secret rites, and you will teach us how to become immortal like the gods? And Demeter says, yes, yeah, sure, okay, I'll do that. They're all dead, by the way, so nobody got immortal. But anyway, uh, you fast forward, every year there were pilgrimages, and they would go from the city of Athens to the city of Eleusis, and they would perform these secret rites. And these rites are kept so secret that today we don't even know what was involved in them. And these rites are called the mysteries. Now, mystery comes from a root, and it means to be quiet or to shut one's mouth, kind of like when someone used to make stew for the working poor in different parts of America, and they called it mystery meat. Like, don't ask where it came from, it's meat. That's all we're going to say about it. Well, you go even farther than that after all of this, and then you get to Christianity. Classical Greek Christians were completely opposed to any religious secrets. They believed nothing was supposed to be hidden. Everything should be out in the open. There are lots of cults today that if you step into them, they'll give you a little bit of information, and then a little bit of information, and a little bit of information. Each step, you get a little bit more. Christianity, ask any question you want. I started off the second week talking about election. It's like, what exactly? We're trying to tell you everything in the scriptures. Nothing is meant to be hidden. And yet, they still started to call these rites the mysteries. You know, why? Because they viewed them with the same exalted awe and reverence that cults did. So why did Paul use this word? Like, again, why did the early Christians use this word? Well, they take this word that held this sway in these people's minds, and they changed it from making things that were hidden to make things known. All the things that you thought were hidden, God in Christ has now made known to everyone. That's the mysteries, the mysteries that God has revealed in Christ, the redeeming these words. People had been abused and mistreated for these pagan mysteries. In the city of Ephesus, they performed these same type of rites in worship of the goddess Artemis, whose temple was world famous, still is. People go on vacation to go and see the ruins of this place. And young girls there were taken, they were enslaved, murdered, sexually assaulted in these rites. And so Paul comes in and he seizes this word, that held this bizarre sway in the hearts of the people at Ephesus. And he says, God does not hide things. God has written all of these things, and now he's revealing what they all mean in the person of Jesus Christ. And it's hard for people to believe because it is so profound as God reveals the mysteries. Mystery actually became, becomes the word in the Christian East that those in the Christian West would start to call sacrament. Sacrament. So you'd have things like the virgin birth. It's considered a mystery because it's revealed, but there is so much more that's kind of unknown. It's in the person of God. Uh, they would even say a nun or a priest when they take their vows. That is considered a mystery or a sacrament. A couple who gets married. That is considered a mystery because you see the words spoken, and yet it's binding heaven and earth together. A person who comes to trust Christ, the way the sun warms your skin on a, on a, on a sunny day, like today. At any moment, our heart is drawn deeper into who Christ is. Mystery. It's known. But there's so much it feels like it's unknown because it's in the great grace of God. And so in Christianity, again, a mystery was something that was once unclear, and now because of God's work in Christ, it is now Fulfilled. We now see what it means. So the mystery is that Christ has come, Christ has died, Christ has risen from the grave, and He will come again. In all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will according to His purpose. And so they started to call this the 
revealed mystery. Because what the Old Testament had been saying for so long that people did not understand, it is now revealed in Christ. God loves, God calls, God redeems, God brings us to himself. Again, when Latin begins to take over the world, they started to forget what this word mystery meant. And so translators wanted to help make a word connect, and so they chose this word called sacramentum. This is what would happen when a soldier would be taken into the Roman army. The sacramentum would have two parts. Number one, the soldier takes an oath in office. And secondly, the army branded him behind the ear with the number of his legion. So sacramentum for a soldier brought new advantages, uh, acquiring legal and social benefits. Ancient Latin theologians took that word sacramentum because they thought it was the best Latin equivalent for the word mystery and what was trying to get across. It is spiritual and physical when we come to trust Christ. We get new responsibilities. We get a new status before God. We become children of God, and we are marked by God's Spirit. You are kind of branded by God's Spirit. Now, in the Eastern Orthodox Church today, they will still call things the holy mysteries, which shows the words are sometimes interchangeable. Now today, I will use the word sacred when I talk about communion or I talk about baptism. And if you're from a Catholic background, that might sound odd to you because in the Catholic Church, the word sacrament is a means of grace. It leads to salvation. It's part of that. We don't hold that word to mean that. We don't believe that communion or baptism saves you in any way, but we do believe they're holy. They're set apart things. And that's why we use the word the way that we do. Nothing is ever a substitute for the gospel. All right. You following so far? Deep breath. Here we go. Someone told me this message is a bit much. Okay, okay. So, back to the mystery of His will. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His mercy, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of His will, according to His purpose, which He set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in Him, things in heaven and things on earth. So, now let's talk about this mystery. Why has God revealed the things that He has? Why does Paul say the things that He has? Well, I got four things. Things. Number one, so we would understand redemption and salvation is centered in His mercy. Why does God reveal it this way? So we would understand His mercy in saving us. The revealed mystery is that we get renewed and restored relationship with God Himself. Now, last year, I sent this message to Michael, one of the guys on staff, and I said, hey, is it too much? And he goes, oh, it's okay, but you should listen to this. And he gave me another message by somebody else named Hamil Su, who kind of said all the things that I just said, but he used the text of 1 Peter. I want to read that to you. 1 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4. Peter says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, unfading, kept in heaven for you. So we are born again to a living hope. It's not a dead hope. It's a revealed hope because God has shown us the mystery and what it means. It comes because of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this happened before we were ever born. We had nothing to do with it. The mystery is that God planned our salvation for us and the coming of Christ before we were ever born. He accomplishes it 2,000 years ago in the person of Christ. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, probably one of, the, one of the best theologians America has ever produced, he says one of my favorite things. He said, we contribute nothing to our salvation except the sin that made it necessary. Wow, totally true. We did nothing to make our salvation happen. Therefore, we can actually have hope because when we mess up, when we have horrible days like I said, our salvation is not based upon our work or our faithfulness. It's based upon God's. And that's beautiful. And it's those words, he has caused us. That goes back to Paul talking about being chosen. They stand out. They reflect that. See, the cross doesn't make us savable. The cross saves. God doesn't leave our salvation to chance. This is why the cross and the resurrection makes it possible. We as Christians, if you trust in Christ, we are recipients of God's action in saving us. Why are we saved? Peter says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ according to his great mercy. What does Paul say? In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Why? According to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. It is not our intelligence. It is not our openness. He saves us because of his mercy. And that is the mystery that is now made known. Any credit we try to put to ourselves in salvation only takes away from God's mercy. And if you want to boil this whole idea of election down, because if you're in a gospel community, I heard you guys had some great conversations last week around this, but you put it down to one word, I would say the word is mercy. 
It's the word mercy, mercy of God alone for us. When people struggle with the idea of election and why some people aren't saved, Tim Keller says it comes down to a struggle to understand that our God is actually merciful, so much more merciful than us because we think we can imagine a better plan of salvation than God himself can. We think God could be more merciful than he already is. We think we might even be more merciful than him because we say, well, why doesn't he save everybody? And if you reject election, you have to say, well, he doesn't want to violate our free will. That's not merciful. A good father knows when to overwhelm the free will of their children. Some of your parents should do it more. Too far? Okay, all right. You overwhelm their free will so that you can save your children. You should save them. You don't want them to hurt themselves. God secures our future for eternity because of what Christ did. Peter says we have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. That means it can't be attacked, it can't be destroyed, it can't be changed. It is kept for us, meaning it is secure. We don't keep it, he keeps it. That's the mystery revealed to us, and it's centered in God's hope and in his grace. The second reason that you see this mystery revealed is so we would be sanctified or understand our salvation. And this is the thing. We see this mystery revealed so we'd understand you're not just saved and left to yourself. You are now being sanctified. Ephesians 1, 4. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. How do we become holy and blameless before him? Jesus. Wait, is this on? Yeah. Jesus, mercy, what he has done. That's how. It's not by our work. And yet God does do a work in us. God just doesn't leave us the way that he starts to move us and change us. I like to call sanctification salvation in present time because where the Bible says he has made us perfect forever, we are being made holy day by day by day. And it's a beautiful work that God does every day that we now live. God is conforming us to the image and likeness of his son. Some people have said, well, if this election thing is true, then I don't have to do anything. I don't even have to be moral at all. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because what we understand is it's God's goodness and God's grace. And we want to reflect who he is by how we begin to live. We are, number one, we are holy and set apart from the world. And secondly, we are now blameless. But that blameless doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from what he has done. God's salvation, when we understand and love him and see what he did, it changes us to want to live our lives in a way that reflect the excellence of who he is. Hebrews 10, 14, for by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. The NIV says it like this, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Being saved by God, it does change us. Sometimes it's fast, sometimes it is painfully slow. I was talking to somebody yesterday about this and like, I don't understand. I keep doing the same things and I don't want to do the same things. Sometimes it's painfully slow, but God is doing a work. We are called in Romans 12 to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. That doesn't save us. We want to offer our lives back because Christ gave, it, gave his life for us. We are not saved by being holy and pleasing. You actually already are holy and pleasing. You already are saved. When you understand God's grace, you can live in ways of freedom as you honor and serve him in your life. And you're not consumed with all your failures. You're consumed with him over you. It's like one of our elders, Mike Carmen, always says, he goes, don't tell me how bad I am. Tell me how good God is because that's going to change how I see things. Harold Ockinga, founding president of Fuller Seminary, said this, If God has elected us, he has not elected us to remain sinners, but to become holy. God never chose us to continue in sin. And this is why it is God doing the work of salvation, God doing the work of sanctification, not us. And sanctification is a work that begins now, today. Eternal life, it's not when you die. It starts today. Mystery revealed. Third reason the mystery is revealed is so we would understand adoption. Adoption, that we have been adopted by God. This is amazing because guess what it tells you? It tells you you are wanted. God wanted you. You're adopted. You're brought in. And love you predestined us for adoption to himself. Why? According to the purpose of his will. Now, adoption is referred to in the Old Testament, God as a father, but technically in that sense, only about 14 times. And it's only in reference to the whole nation of Israel. But you get to the New Testament and Jesus comes and he addresses God almost exclusively, only as father. 
I mean, the Gospels record Jesus using this term for God the Father more than 63 times. And I don't even know if he references God in any other way except maybe on the cross in uh, when he references Psalm 22. I could be wrong. You can show me where I'm wrong. I don't care. But no one in the entire history of Israel prayed to God like this. And the word Jesus uses for Father, it's, it's this word that a child would address their dad. Here's the mystery revealed, okay? Paul says this mystery is that we all get that relationship, every single one of us. Romans 8, 15, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. I keep telling you this. This is the first word a baby would say, Abba, 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 right? And they, just, and they go, oh, he said, Dad. Like, that, that's what they're doing right there. That's us. We get to call God Dad. Uh, Galatians 4, 6, and 7. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, 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 Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. And son means sons and daughters, okay? Do you sense that God is your father? Do you sense that? Like, not if you had a bad dad, he's not a bad, he's a good dad, full of mercy and grace. Do we view him that way? John chapter 1, verse 12, Yet to all, all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Revealed mystery. Revealed mystery. J.I. Packer wrote this, If you want to judge how well a person understands Christianity, find out how much he makes of the thought of being God's child and having God as his father. If this, if this is not the thought that prompts and controls his worship and prayers and his whole outlook on life, it means that he does not understand Christianity very well at all. And that's not a dig. That's a way to say we need to grow in this. The Ephesians needed to grow in this. That's why Paul talks about this. And this kind of leads to my last one. There's probably more, but I'm out of time. You're welcome. Here's my last one, okay, <laughs> is this. So we would praise him for his mercy and grace. Why does he reveal the mystery the way that he does? So we would praise him for his mercy and grace. Verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. One writer says this, true worship is valuing or treasuring of God above all things. As our salvation should make us specifically praise God for His goodness and His grace, what He has done for us, because we are the undeserving. From the very beginning of the Scriptures, you see that God built us to be worshipers. It's, it's part of our DNA, but it's part of the fabric of the entire universe. You'll read how the rocks and the trees and the streams and the oceans, they clap their hands, they cry out. Everything is crying out in worship to God. They do it naturally. The ones who fight it are us, are us, because we want to be our own God. We have run from him. We have broken relationship. But God in Christ comes to rescue and redeem us. And we would praise him for his mercy and his grace. God created this world a certain way so that all creation would worship him. It makes us complete. Like John Piper always likes to say that when God is most glorified, we live in the most joy. That is just simply how it is. Uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson has this famous quote, and he says this, A person will worship something. Have no doubt about that. We may think our tribute is paid in secret in the dark recesses of our heart, but it will come out. That which dominates our imagination and our thoughts will determine our lives and our character. Therefore, it behooves us to be careful what we worship. For what we are worshiping, we are becoming. That's important for us to understand. We need to be honest with ourselves because we are going to become like what we worship. And if you view God as an angry father who's just waiting to smack you when you get out of line, that's going to result in the way that you live. But if you view God as God is full of mercy, grace, who has called you, who has set holiness upon you, you are going to live completely differently. You will live a life of mercy and grace when you begin to understand that God is a God who has bestowed mercy and grace upon us. That is is a revealed mystery. Because how do we live with a solid structure in our life so you ever know where you stand? Because every time you talk to somebody new, you're, you're being weighed by somebody else, how they're thinking about you. Every job you take, every job you leave, every new friendship that you make, how do you get solid footing to navigate areas of your life where maybe you have depression or anxiety? How do you work well when everyone around you seems like they're a crook and like, I just do the same thing because I'm never going to get ahead if I don't work like them. We worship Jesus as he has been revealed. We see what he has done for us. Worship moves us to a place where we long to adore who he is, to see God as he really is. Not some God we make up in our heads, but God as he really is. And then we start to see the way God created us, the way he leads us. Again, how do we know what God is like? How do we know where we stand? Want to hear the revealed mystery? In love, 
He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to, the, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace. Revealed mystery. It is freely given. Glorious grace. That is all part of it. So you know where you stand. And it's beautiful. It is. The words kind of pour out from Paul throughout these first few chapters. I mean, it's like we are seated in the heavenly realms in Christ. Our position opens us to every spiritual blessing. Uh, we have been chosen before time began for His love and His good pleasure. And the choice was not due to anything in us, but because of Jesus. God saving us the way that He does really gives us a reason to rejoice. Because we have been saved. We are being sanctified. We have been adopted. And all of this results in praise. Our lives before Him. It all comes because we understand the revealed mystery of the gospel. One writer says this, and I'll put it in your notes. He says, He begraced us. It's like, hasn't beguiled you. The revealed mystery is, He begraced you. And it's like, I just, when you understand His grace and His goodness, the revealed mystery, you have been begraced. And you're like, I just love God. What's, what's so weird? You're so weird. I, I, I've been begraced. He's given me grace. And mercy. And I just, I just want to follow him. I just want to love him. It's, it's, I've been begraced. You're never going to do that. I get it. But, <laughs> but it is pretty darn cool that God has done that for us in his love and in his mercy. And today, when you come to communion that we invite you to, I would invite you to come to communion in a way that you become excited that he has begraced you that he has given you love and grace and mercy. And when you break that cracker that reminds you of his body that was broken and you dip it in the wine or the grape juice as you remember his blood that was shed, that you would just be begraced. And you'd be like, I don't even know what I can say right now because God is simply that good, that he would draw me to himself, that he would love me the way that he does, that he would call and speak to me and, and call me his child even after all the dumb things that I keep doing where I fail every step of the way I feel like, and yet my righteousness is not based upon me. It's not based upon my failures. It is based upon His grace, laying all of this upon us because He is simply that good. So when you take communion today, remember that. Lay all of your works righteousness of trying to make yourself righteous before God down at His feet and simply begin to walk in His grace and his goodness. If you need prayer, maybe you are someone who has in your life had this picture of who God is as a bad dad or an angry dad, and, and you have to work yourself into sanctification. You've got to work yourself into holiness so God loves you enough. If you've ever said, I can't go into that place because if I do, the walls will fall down or lightning will strike me. You gave yourself a whole lot of credit, uh, <laughs> and you want someone to pray with you because of that, because maybe God is starting to change your mind about who he is, we would love to pray with you. Uh, right across the way in the lounge, as Sarah said. And if the lounge is busy, we have places to take you if you'd like to go pray with somebody. Uh, we would just love to pray with you about that, to kind of walk those things. If you have questions about this morning, uh, go over there and ask them. If they can't answer it, come back and talk to me, and I'll muddle my way through it. We'll, fi we'll figure it out. Because we want to be a people who are simply undone by His mercy and grace and not getting caught up in, in all these terms we may not fully understand yet. Because i got to tell you, theologians have talked about these ideas of election and grace and mercy for hundreds of years. And you don't have to have the answer to all of it today. You can begin to walk through each piece of it. But we have to come to the place where we understand it is God's mercy that saves us and rescues us. Because He's the one who is good. Uh, we are a people who, who give, but Element doesn't pass an offering plate. There's offering boxes next to the side walls. You can give online. But we give as a response to God's giving to us, that God has done this work and loved us and drawn us to himself. And we become generous because he is simply generous. That's why we give the way that we do and don't pass the plate. I'd encourage you to take those sermon notes and to go through the questions in there and kind of walk through all the ways that, that God has been good to you where God is calling you and drawing you and showing you the goodness of his mercy, his love that has been spoken so that we get to live in his grace. Let us live as a big grace people because he has begraced us. Let's pray. Father, this morning, I ask that we would come to the place where we would understand your majesty and your goodness, which is all tied up in your mercy that you have brought grace to us as a people and that we would live in that grace. 
And as we better understand our own salvation, our own sanctification day by day, it would cause us in the end to be a more merciful people, a people who better reflect the same grace that we first received. Because our life now is not found in ourselves or what we do. It is found in the living hope that we have in you. We thank you for revealing all of these mysteries that you clearly lay out throughout all those Old Testament scriptures and that the New Testament comes along, Jesus shows up and you show us what you were meaning all along in clarity. And I ask that we would be those who live in clarity of who you are and what you've done and that we would be a people who honor and glorify you first and that there'd be a deep, resounding and abiding joy because of your mercy and grace. And we ask this in your son's good name. Amen. Amen.